good day to you wherever you are in the world and welcome to MVP Days. I'm Kenny Lowe and I'm going to spend some time today hopefully helping to put cloud into context for you and trying to really hone in on where it's going and where you can take advantage of some of the features available right now. I guess before we can really dive deep into what makes the Azure ecosystem so compelling and unique though, we need to do a bit of groundwork on defining uh, or maybe in some cases redefining some terms. And cloud computing isn't exactly a new term, however, it is one whose name is often taken in vain and often applied to situations where it really shouldn't. When we're talking about cloud computing here, what we're really talking about is, isn't just a place to run applications, it's a model for writing, deploying uh, and running applications. To kind of put this into a bit of context, let's talk a bit about how applications are developed, deployed and managed. So the development and deployment of your typical classic application really hasn't changed that much since client server architecture first came on the scene. Virtualization brought new ways to manage these applications and to protect them via the infrastructure around them. But the actual development and deployment of those applications is fundamentally the same uh, today, whether it's on physical tin or in virtual machines. The development, deployment, and lifecycle patterns of cloud-native applications, though, are fundamentally different to that approach taken when developing for physical hardware or even for virtual machines. In a classic physical or virtual environment, really all of our efforts go into improving, securing, and protecting the infrastructure in order to avoid problems with the application. We deploy highly available storage, network, and compute infrastructure, which can survive catastrophic failure, in order to make sure our applications keep on running regardless. The world of the cloud native application is distinctly different. And actually I'd suggest that the application design patterns that define a cloud native application today didn't come about by explicit design, but by necessity. In the infancy of platforms like AWS and Azure, traditional application design patterns just weren't workable due to the potential for failure of the underlying hosts, the lack of features like live migration, and actually our, just our inability to influence or manage any of the underlying infrastructure. To make application deployment uh, in these platforms viable, the patterns used for creating them had to change. This also gives us a pretty nice line of delineation to look at when deciding where to run our applications today. A classic application, which is never going to change, is probably still best placed running in a Hyper-V environment on premises. Moving it into Azure in a lift and shift is probably likely to result in reduced availability and higher cost. On the other hand, if you want to change that application and start splitting bits of it off into microservices or evolve bits of it to take advantage of PaaS features that only exist in a cloud native environment, then a lift and shift into Azure can be a very important first step on that journey. I guess the key takeaway here is that there is no one size fits all environment for every application. And as ever, we should strive to make sure that the workload uh, fits the environment. Cloud native platforms don't necessarily replace on-premises virtualization, but conversely, on-premises virtualization platforms cannot match or replace cloud native environments. This then takes us on to a very important question when we're talking about hybrid cloud, and that is, what is a private cloud? Because clearly you can't have a hybrid environment without something running on-premises. It's a contentious question, and if you ask 10 people, you'll get 15 answers, but I think it can be boiled down quite easily when we put it into the context of the wider public cloud ecosystem. There's a rule in economics called the rule of three, wherein any new industry will start off with a plethora of players, each vying for control and market share, but over time that industry will trend down to two or three key players who control the majority of that market, with other niche players filling unique specific gaps. We've seen this play out time and time again through the IT industry with operating systems, with hypervisors, in the mobile phone market and so on. This is nothing new. This year, we reached that steady state with public cloud, where now it's not a case of who will win, Microsoft or Amazon, but rather they've kind of both already won. Now we, the end customers, can reap the benefits of their innovation. So what then is a private cloud? So for me, it's an on-premises infrastructure which allows you to run services consistently with one of the leaders in the public cloud space. And that's really the key. It's about bringing that pace of innovation, those features and capabilities that don't exist in a traditional virtualization platform and bringing them on-premises. Today, both Microsoft and Amazon are doing interesting things in this space. With Microsoft, it's all about Azure Stack, which we'll touch on in a little, in a little bit. 
Amazon, on the other hand, are starting to bring some of their services back to the edge with their recent joint announcement with VMware that soon Amazon uh, Relational Database Services, RDS, will run as a managed service within VMware. This is really a time where we as the cloud consumers start to benefit and the whole world of options opens up to us that just wasn't there previously. No longer do we have to think of cloud as just a place to put our applications and data. Cloud isn't just a Microsoft or Amazon data center. Cloud becomes a model that we can apply to any location we need to develop and run our applications using cloud native tooling. So what then is Microsoft's cloud uh, message when it comes to hybrid? Well, largely it's centered around these four core pillars around identity, security, data platform, and the application lifecycle. And this is all well and good. And if you're able to exist solely within the Microsoft ecosystem, then more power to you. But for the majority of organizations, the reality is far more of a multi-cloud approach uh, than this hybrid panacea that we see here. There's no one answer to what is hybrid versus what is multi-cloud, and different vendors have their own slant on this. For me, though, to define hybrid and multi-cloud broadly, hybrid is consistent in terms of the tooling approach, skill set that you use to manage it, the core security concepts, the identity management, and largely everything we saw in the previous slide. It's all about consistency by default, consistency built through by design. Multi-cloud, on the other hand, makes use of products from multiple vendors without a cohesive and consistent approach to management, security, identity, and so on. And that's not to say that multi-cloud is wrong. In fact, uh, it's the most common model in play today. If you're using, for example, Dropbox and DocuSign and Salesforce.com, you're already in a multi-cloud world without ever touching Azure or AWS. While hybrid has this consistency built in by default, the key here then is to see where you can bring similar levels of consistency to the multi-cloud environment. Consistency is what brings you your uh, operational efficiencies as well as significant security benefits. The first place that I would always look to start to unify uh, and, and bring consistency to a multi-cloud environment is with identity. Identity is uh, common across pretty much every single application out there today. Pretty much every application has some form of user login. Uh, and managing these multiple disparate identities across the multi-cloud is a real pain point today. Active Directory is pretty ubiquitous across, well, pretty much every organization today. I do encounter the occasional uh, person or, or organization that doesn't have Active Directory, but these are very much in the minority, and they tend to be those who are born in, for example, G Suite. For the vast majority of organizations, though, Active Directory is ubiquitous on-premises. And when we say on-premises here, this could be one forest, multiple forests, one domain, multiple domains, uh, one site, multiple sites. It really doesn't matter. For our purposes here, it's Active Directory on-premises. The first way that most organizations extend that identity out with their firewall is by allowing users to VPN back into their premises uh, using that same consistent identity. The next thing that most organizations do is extend out to Office 365. Uh, and this is the first time that, uh, or the first place that most organizations make their first mistake. And the first mistake they make is by assuming that Azure Active Directory is a component of Office 365. It is not. Azure Active Directory is its own service, uh, and it should be looked at in complete isolation. Yes, Office 365 makes use of Azure Active Directory for uh, its users and groups management, as does Azure and Azure Stack and Power BI and Intune and a plethora of Microsoft Cloud services. Each of these exists within the bounds of Azure Active Directory tenant here. Uh, and the Azure Active Directory tenant can be synchronized from the golden image of your on-premises Active Directory. That's all well and good in the Microsoft Cloud ecosystem, but actually it goes a bit beyond that. First of all, Azure Active Directory is able to provide business-to-business -business collaboration by default. So what do we mean by that? It means we can take a user from a partner Azure Active Directory and grant them access to, for example, a Power BI dashboard within our Azure Active Directory. And this doesn't require creating domain trusts or punching holes in firewalls or creating new users in your Active Directory or managing a whole new user lifecycle. It allows you to apply whatever security measures that you want and want to enforce within your Azure Active Directory, for example, multi-factor authentication to those users in your partner Azure AD, but these are just features which are built into the model. When that user leaves their, their uh, 
organization and their admin disables them in their Azure Active Directory, that filters through to yours and those guest users are automatically disabled in your Azure AD as well. It's a really nice clean way to manage the user lifecycle across partner organizations or even across organizations within the same group of companies. Azure Active Directory extends even further beyond this though, because actually it can function as a single point of identity for, well, a huge number of enterprise applications out there today. Uh, I think at this stage we should jump into a demo just to see what exactly does Azure Active Directory integration with an enterprise application look like. So let's just flick across to a browser window here. GitHub is a hugely popular platform these days, and while you may be familiar with individual GitHub accounts, many companies are also using GitHub organizations to manage their code repos. In this case, I have an organization called Kenny Low Org, which I want to integrate with Azure Active Directory. In order to do this, the first thing I need to do is navigate to the Azure AD portal, and from there, locate and click on the Enterprise Applications link on the left-hand side. This blade gives a number of options, but the one that we're interested in here is the new application button at the top here. Clicking this will open up a list of applications which are pre-validated for integration with Azure Active Directory. Note that the 3,035 applications listed here aren't the only ones which can be integrated with Azure AD. They're just the ones which have step-by-step -step instructions to find. Over and above these ones, you can also integrate applications you're developing, on-premises applications, uh, or indeed pretty much any application that you want. Today though, we're going to integrate GitHub, which happens to be a gallery application. So search for or scroll to the GitHub icon, select it, and once its blade appears, click on Add. After a few seconds saying Adding Application, it'll give you a success message, and then take you to the configuration pane for your new application. Within this pane, the first thing that we're going to want to do is give a user access to the application as it'll be pretty useless if no one can log into it. So let's navigate to users and groups and from there, add a user. While access can be controlled by user or group, for simplicity here, I'm going to grant access to a single user. Uh, once this loads, actually, you'll see that there are three users here. There's one native user, one Microsoft account, and one Azure AD B2B guest, which is my Dell EMC account. Any of these can be granted access to this application, uh, but let's just use the native, app, nat native account here by selecting and then assigning that. Click Submit and then Assign. Once the assignment is complete and we have a success message, we can move on to the single sign-on integration. There are various ways to integrate single sign-on, but SAML is our most secure method, so where it's available, let's use it. Okay. In the single sign-on config page, there are a few things we need to, need to configure. This is all documented, but I know the process, so I'll just run through it here. First, enter the GitHub sign-on URL. So it's github.com slash org slash org slash SSO. And then the GitHub identifier is github.com slash org slash org. Click save. And that's the entirety of the config we need to do at the Azure Active Directory end. It really is just that simple. There are some values that we need to configure at GitHub's end. So I'll scroll down here in the pane and look at steps three and four, which gives us those values, and then flip across to the GitHub org. Navigate to settings and then to security and click to enable the SAML single sign-on. It's going to ask for three pieces of information, all of which are provided by Azure AD. So first we have the login URL, which we just copy and paste across. Then the issuer, which again, copy and paste directly from AAD. And then finally, it asks for a certificate. This is the base 64 certificate, which is listed in step three here. So all we're going to do is download that, open it up in Notepad, and then copy and paste the contents of it across to our GitHub contents page. And that's it. Click Save and then test the SAML configuration, and all things being equal, we should get a nice big green tick box. If I now navigate to a new incognito window and sign into GitHub, note that I'm still signing in with my individual account here because I integrated with an org, not my individual account. But if I uh, sign in here with my Kenny Low account and then navigate to my profile, and to my organizations, 
when I try to go to the Kenilo Org organization now, you'll see at the top that it's asking to me to authenticate my account. Doing this will ask for my Azure Active Directory credentials. And actually it's here that we see one of the immediate benefits of integrating uh, SSO like this. And that's the fact that after I enter my username and password, I get prompted for a multi-factor authentication because my Azure Active Directory account is already configured for multi-factor authentication. So just by integrating this application with Azure AD, not only have I taken better control of my user access, I've also implemented MFA against it just by default without giving the user anything new to do that they don't already know. This is hugely powerful, and even then it's only just scratching the surface of what Azure AD could do for you, but hopefully that's a useful demo. Another area where Microsoft is quite vocal today is around Azure Stack. But for many, it's not clear where Azure Stack fits in their cloud strategy, if indeed at all. So we've seen how Azure Active Directory can bring consistency to identity. Uh, so now let's look at how Azure Stack brings consistency to the development, deployment, and management of applications, regardless of where they need to run. Firstly, the goal of Azure Stack is not to replace Azure or to be used instead of Azure. Where workloads can run in public Azure, that is still the best place to run those workloads. Azure Stack exists to provide consistent Azure services where Azure cannot go. That's not to say that every service in Azure is in Azure Stack. They're not, and nor will they ever be. The critical point here is that it's management APIs, it's PowerShell commandlets, the portal experience, and the overall uh, management experience is consistent with Azure. So if your developers and IT team are familiar with Azure Public Cloud, they're already familiar with Azure Stack and they can use it to run cloud native applications just as they would in Azure. Azure Stack is supplied as an appliance, and while that appliance runs the rich goodness of Windows Server 2016, Hyper-V 2016, Storage Spaces Direct, the 2016 software-defined networking infrastructure, and so on and so forth, it's locked down and immutable to the cloud operator. Our interactions with Azure Stack are through an admin web portal, not through traditional tools like VMM or Windows Admin Center, Hyper-V Manager, Failover Cluster Manager, and so on. This really amplifies what we spoke about earlier. It's not about the infrastructure anymore. It's all about the applications. We can't change, tweak, or impact the underlying Azure Stack infrastructure. So all of the time we used to spend down in the guts is suddenly freed up to spend uh, bringing higher level value. This is where we as IT pros get time back, uh, which we can spend learning and understanding how to get the most out of higher tier services in Azure and Azure Stack. The list here is by no means exhaustive, but let's touch on a few of those ways in which Azure Stack differs from a traditional virtualization platform. From an IaaS perspective, we have VM horizontal scalability through VM skill sets. We have templated container cluster deployment through Kubernetes using the same ACS engine as we have in Azure. We have the richness of a powerful software-defined networking infrastructure without the need to manage any of it under the hood. Storage in this case is not provided by a SAN, it's provided by Storage Spaces Direct. However, it's presented in the same way as it is in Azure, as blob, table, and queue storage, designed to be used by cloud native workloads. Over on the PaaS side, we have the Azure App Service to deploy scalable and resilient web applications without having to manage web servers. We have Azure Functions to deliver functions as a service. IoT Hub and Event Hubs are coming shortly. And then the richness of uh, Cloud Foundry and Pivotal Cloud Foundry to bring cloud agnostic PaaS capabilities. Yes, you could just dump existing virtual machines into Azure Stack and yes, they will work, but that's really not the point of the platform. There's already an extremely rich ecosystem built up around Hyper-V for running traditional VM workloads. So use Hyper-V for those workloads, which need to run on premises and Azure Stack for cloud native workloads, which need to run on premises. Over and beyond those built-in features, we have access to the Azure Marketplace through Azure Stack and can syndicate whatever Azure Stack validated images we want from Azure to our on-premises environment now. Anyone who's had to manage a VM image gallery in vCloud Director or Azure Pack knows well the pain of keeping those images up to date or even just building them and securing them in the first place. In Azure Stack, that work is already done for you. If you want to deploy an Ubuntu image, then you'll use the exact same image as you would use in public Azure, which has been created and blessed by Canonical. 
the above table shows a tiny subset of the marketplace images available in Azure Stack, and it really can't be overstated just how powerful a feature this is, both from an ease of use and a platform consistency perspective. I really want to drill this point home that Azure Stack and Azure are not dumping grounds to migrate existing VMs into and forget about them. These are cloud native platforms, which allow a consistent development and management approach regardless of location. I've worked with a number of companies already using Azure uh, in certain geographies as a preferred platform, but they're hobbled by regulatory compliance requirements in other regions that they operate in where they just cannot use Azure. What Azure Stack allows them to do is deploy the exact same applications using the same tooling, the same skill set, while at the same time addressing these compliance requirements. No other cloud provider enables this today. Amazon does offer hybrid virtualization via VMware on AWS in a few select regions, and their hybrid cloud story is starting to evolve with the announcement of their RDS service moving to run on VMware, but fundamentally Azure is leaps and bounds ahead in this space today. Then there are those workloads which need to run either at the far end of connectivity or indeed totally disconnected. For example, real-time analytics in a factory floor may not be able to tolerate the round-trip latency to an Azure data center and back. So let's do the processing at the edge on Azure Stack using machine learning models which were developed in public Azure. One platform, one skill set, one way to manage the entire hybrid platform end-to-end, -end, both from an IT pro and from a developer perspective. It's hugely powerful. As Microsoft builds out an increasingly compelling IoT infrastructure across Azure Sphere, moving devices, industrial IoT, uh, Azure Data Box Edge, and other elements that we don't have time to cover in depth today, you see that Azure Stack fits firmly in the center of that ecosystem. That's not to say that Azure Stack is required to make use of all of these elements on the left. It's quite possible that Azure alone will fulfill the needs for many applications. But where Azure cannot meet those needs, Azure Stack is there to enable all those elements on the left-hand side to function. IoT Hub and Event Hubs, as I said earlier, are coming to Azure Stack just as they are in Azure, sitting firmly at the center of what really is an exploding ecosystem of devices and data at the edge. And that's really where I want your minds to go when thinking about Azure Stack. It's not about running VMs in a different place. It's all about cloud native capabilities and Azure features. At Ignite, Microsoft didn't announce IoT Hub for Hyper-V. It's an Azure feature, so it comes to Azure Stack. And that's where new cloud first application investments will continue to go. First into Azure, and then based on demand into Azure Stack in order to support a growing ecosystem that stretches from tiny sensors at the edge right up to hyperscale data centers and everything in between with consistency built in by design. Yes, Azure has more regions than AWS and Google combined today, but actually I think it's clear from this image that there are still huge gaps in coverage. And until we can break the speed of light, latency matters. And until we have 100% global 5G coverage, bandwidth matters. Until all the world unites under one kumbaya, regulatory compliance requirements will still matter. And in order to meet those needs, Azure Stack exists in service providers, in enterprises, going where Azure cannot go, delivering a consistent hybrid experience. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.